Hello, this lecture is on the Mexican-American War. War with Mexico in the late 1840s transform, transformed America. The conflict fed by a powerful spirit of expansionism resulted in a huge acquisition of land for the United States. The nation's reach from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean foreshadowed an emerging world power, but it also opened the door for serious social and political discord. In the years leading up to the Mexican-American War, American leaders had mixed success with diplomatic relations with European nations. As a result of the Adams Onus Treaty of 1819, United States acquired East Florida from the Spanish who were facing difficulties elsewhere. In exchange, the United States surrendered its tenuous claim to Texas. Four years later, America flexed its muscles with the Monroe Doctrine that said Americans would resist intervention in Europe, providing Europe stayed out of the affairs of the Western Hemisphere. Although the doctrine was not law, it was a weighty statement that proclaimed to Europeans that Americans were serious about protecting their backyard. In this climate, American-British relations increasingly soured. British leaders were annoyed that many of their factory workers immigrated to America. Americans resented the necessity of borrowing from England for internal improvements such as canal building. Nasty stories were written of each other and sharing the same language meant that each could read the other's offensive remarks. There wasn't that problem when the Americans were had a rift with France. There was also the territorial dispute in, in, in Maine, in the state of Maine. The Maine boundary question was submitted to the King of the Netherlands in 1827. Four years later, his decision offered a compromise, a compromise that Maine rejected, believing it deserved better. The issues heated up in the 1830s, in particular in 1839, when American and Canadian lumbermen clashed on the Aristotuk River. The Aristotuk War, which actually was a bloodless war, called attention to the problem of, again, this disputed boundary line. Lord Alberdeen was sent to America to improve American-British relations. Daniel Webster represented America. One important subject affecting negotiations was the conflict between the Americans and the British over the slave trade. The British wanted the right to search possible American slave trade ships. The main boundary issue was complicated by the fact that until 1820, Maine had been a part of Massachusetts, each state having vested interest in the dispute. When the Americans actually secretly discovered a map that supported British claims, the pace of negotiations quickened. A compromise boundary line was set that offered the British 5,000 of the 12,000 square miles of territory in dispute. This allowed the British to secure a military road 
to Quebec. Boundary adjustments were also made elsewhere in New York State along the 45th parallel and in the Minnesota region where the Americans gained 6,500 square miles of what turned out to be priceless or bearing land. In the end, both sides approved the Webster Ashburton Agreement of 1842 that gave most of the disputed territory to the United States and established a clear northeastern boundary with British North America. Before 1841, there were few white Americans in Oregon country. But in subsequent years, there was a surge of immigrants moving westward. The American public, now firm in the conviction, it was their duty as well as their destiny to expand back the nation's claim for new lands. And to validate their beliefs, hundreds of thousands of Americans migrated throughout the West. Between the year 1840 and 1860, 300,000 traveled westward. For example, people were pulled to Oregon and California, whose beauty and wealth had slowly filtered east. Although many people considered it nothing less than suicide to attempt to cross the Rockies and what was considered the great American desert, a growing stream of families took the risk. Setting out from the Mideast, normally this would be Missouri or Iowa, Setting out from the Mideast in the spring, they traveled across the plains to the Rockies with their wagons pulled by oxen. If they made 15 to 25 miles a day, they would reach the Continental Divide by July. From that point, the trip was a momentous challenge. While the reckless frenzy for gold in California after 1849 created powerful image of this period, the miners were an exception to the typical migrants who came west with their families to plow and settle. Many who went to California, that is, the ones who were attracted to the promise of gold and the gold rush were single men willing to take their chances in a boom economy that could go bust. And we can see the various trails making their way to the West. You have the California Trail, the Mormon Trail, the Old Spanish Trail, the Oregon Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. The 1840s witnessed the par excellence years of frontier advancement. In 1844, the issue of Oregon became highly political. It was all very much connected to presidential politics. Unsatisfied with the joint occupation arrangement, American expansionists stated that the United States should take Oregon all the way up to 5440. So this was uh, significantly north of the 49th parallel. And there was this conflict 
uh, over the disputed boundaries, British North America believed that they had claimed to land south of the 49th parallel. So the two were had to had to work this out. But in the middle of the fiery election, it uh, the rhetoric did get quite heated. Well, President James Polk, who took office in March of 1845, was bound by the Democratic platform to assert America's claim to the entire territory. And this was something that was pushed by the Democratic Party during the election. His expansionism went beyond electioneering. And he stated the desire for Oregon in his inaugural address in 1845. So this is beyond just extravagant platforming. This is something that he presents in his inaugural address. Well, the British took notice of Polk's uncompromising position. In early 1846, Congress passed a resolution that empowered the president to terminate joint occupation, but within several weeks, the Americans did accept the British proposal of a 49th parallel boundary. And this was the line that the Americans had agreed with before the political emotions of 1840s expansionism rose, had risen uh, sharply. So it seems pretty logical when when one looks at the, the decision on just continuing on with the 49th parallel that had been the case um, uh, further to, to the east. So, so the 49th parallel then runs all the way to the to the water uh, to the you, you can see the Puget Sound. Well, the issue of Mexico was far more serious. Conflict with Mexico was rooted in the Texas experience. Both President Adams that is President John Adams and Pre President Andrew Jackson, so 1820s, 1830s, both of these presidents had open negotiations for Texas, but the, Amer the Mexicans resisted any deals. In the meantime, an increasing number of Americans took advantage of settlement opportunities in Texas started when the Spanish granted a large tract of land to Moses Austin in the year 1821. And this was legalized by the New Mexican government the following year. And Moses Austin was, uh, he was from Connecticut and he was a, a business person, but he was very much interested in a colonization enterprise in, uh, in the Spanish territory of Texas. And he got uh, approval, his, he got permission from the Spanish government to have a small co colony of uh, 300 Anglo-American families. Actually, um, Moses Austin uh, passed away shortly after, and it was his son, Stephen Austin, who um, took the baton and continued the colonization pro uh, project that led to the first of the uh, colonists into Texas. And this was uh, in late. 1821. Well, things were fine initially, but as American newcomers began to outnumber Mexicans in this Texas region, 
tensions rose. In 1835, Texans revolted in the famous battle at the Alamo in San Antonio. All Americans, and there were approximately 200, were killed by the Mexican army. So there was a showdown between these rebels and the much larger Mexican army. The Americans lost another major battle soon after, but in the following year, that is in 1836, they were victorious. They scored a victory. Captured by the Americans, General Santa Ana signed treaties that gave Texas to the victors. And this was, uh, would be north of the Rio Grande River. After achieving independence, although this independence was not recognized by, by Mexico, Texas wanted to enter the United States. And just a clarification here is that what the, what the general uh, Santana had done was not approved by the politi by the Mexican Mexican politicians because of the slavery question and the American government's unwillingness to go to war against Mexico. The United States denied the annexation of Texas. So here we have this Texas Republic began in 1836 and the Americans, the American government in Washington is reluctant and in the end uh, denies the annex annexation of Texas. With a population of approximately 70,000 to the 7 million of the Republic of Mexico, the young Texas Republic was always on the defensive. Going deeper in debt, Texas considered closer relations with the French and the British. So actually what, what the politicians did, the Texan politician, is they alternately played on the fears of England and the United States. And what came out of this was that the United States back in Washington, they were prompted to go ahead and approve the annexation of Texas. In 1845, outgoing, outgoing President John Tyler signed the Congress approved annexation resolution. Texas agreed and it became official before the end of the year. So in late 1845, it 1845, it became, it becomes official. These developments did not go well with Mexico, to no surprise, and Mexico responded by returning its diplomats from Washington. President Polk, who came to office in March of 1845, made one more serious attempt to reopen diplomatic relations by sending John Slidell to Mexico. The American government wanted Mexico to acknowledge the Rio Grande as the legitimate boundary of Texas. In return, Washington would cover the damage claims that Americans demanded from Mexico. The American government also offered Mexico five million for New Mexico and would pay up to 25 million for California. 
And just going back to the map there, you can see the land that was claimed by Texas and Mexico. And Mexico believed it had territory uh, north of the Rio Grande. The Texans believed they uh, they claimed the land all the way to the Rio, Glan Rio Glan Grande. Without showing much appreciation that the youthful Mexico lacked experience in self-government, the Americans probably set unrealistic goals. When the Mexican government of Jose Heria showed signs of negotiating, more militant politicians took over the government. Led by Mariano Paredes, the new government sought the assistance of Britain. The Mexicans had burned their bridges with France when they did not honor their debts. The young nation appeared troublesome with its periodic self-civil wars Driven by pride rather than prudence, the Mexican leaders did not negotiate with Slidell, and they were, for the most part, preparing for war with the United States. Polk wanted California, and if it took war with Mexico, so be it. However, he was wise enough to, to avoid being the instigator. He, he was wise enough not to start the war. He did send General Zachary Taylor to the Texas border, and Taylor was to keep an eye on the disputed region. And this is when actually the Mexicans expelled Slidell. So there was no negotiations with Slidell. And Pope viewed this as treachery. He, he viewed the Mexican response as treachery. The Mexicans played their hand poorly since Texas was a lost cause for them. And, and their ch best chance to hold California would have been to continue negotiations with the Americans, but they chose another route. In late April 1846, the Mexicans declared a defensive war. Upon Slidell's return to Washington the following month, Polk and his cabinet talked of war. A war message was submitted to Congress almost immediately when word was received, the Mexicans was involved in a skirmish with General Taylor's troops on, quote, American territory north of the Rio Grande. Congress appropriated 10 million for war. Now, as far as the, the voting with Congress, it was 174 to 14 in the House that approved the war. And in the Senate, it was 40 senators to only two opposing for war. After crossing into Mexican territory, Taylor managed to win several victories. The Americans took control of the city of Monterey in September, and that is uh, on the Pacific coast there, just north of Los Angeles, but south of San Francisco. So the Americans were on the offensive in New Mexico and California. General Stephen Kearney captured Santa Fe, and John Fremont gained control of most of California. And for Fremont, there really wasn't any kind of opposition. Polk's strategy 
was to seize territory and force the Mexicans to come to terms, to quote, conquer a peace. Striking a major blow, Gen General Winfield Scott took the city of Veracruz and marched towards Mexico City. Traveling with the army was Nicholas Trist, who was empowered to conclude peace whenever the moment seemed to be favorable. Trist and Scott attempted to bribe Santa Ana with $10,000, but the Mexican leader simply took the money and began bolstering his defenses. Although the blundering Trist was recalled by Washington, he disobeyed and continued to negotiate with the moderate Mexican faction that came to power. The terms of peace was signed at Guadalupe Hidalgo, and this was on February 2nd, 1848. The United States received New Mexico and California and Texas with the Rio Grande as the southern boundary. The Mexicans received $15 million in return. However, the cost was high. The Americans on the American side, 13,000 died. Actually, most of this was by disease. So over this two year war, we have 13,000 Americans dead. Elected in Congress as a Whig in 1846, that's spelled W-H-I-G, this political party that uh, actually was not, didn't, uh, its life was not, wasn't too long. And, if, and then we see what happens is the Whig being a forerunner of the Republic Party that's, that will be on the scene shortly. Well, elected in Congress as a Whig in 1846, Abraham Lincoln opposed the war, calling it immoral and pro-slavery. Shortly before the signing of the peace treaty, he demanded some answers and introduced a series of resolutions in late 1847. And the, the number of resolutions were eight, and I will just uh, read four of them. It begins as thus, therefore resolved by the House of Representatives that the President of the United States be respectfully requested to inform this House first, whether the spot in which the blood of our citizens was shed as in his messages declared was or was not within the territory of Spain at least after the Treaty of 1819 until the Mexican Revolution. Second, whether that spot is or is not within the territory which was wrested from Spain by the revolutionary government of Mexico. And down further to the seventh resolution, whether our citizens whose blood was shed as in his message declared were or were not at that time armed officers and soldiers sent into that settlement by the military order of the president through the secretary of state. And finally, eighth, whether the military force of the United States was or was not sent into that settlement after General Taylor had more than once intimated to the War Department that in his opinion, no such movement was necessary to the defense or protection of Texas. Well, Lincoln, um, many actually within his party were, were not too happy with him. And uh, there was one who commented that they saw him as sort of like a Benedict Arnold, saw him as a uh, 
a traitor. Lincoln's position certainly was no match for the enthusiasm for expansionism in the Southwest. Philip Hone, a, another Whig and former mayor of New York, complained that the peace, quote, negotiated by an unauthorized agent with an unacknowledged government submitted by an accidental president to a dissatisfied Senate has notwithstanding these objections in form been confirmed. Historians on both sides of the argument make good points. However, the behavior of Mexican leaders helped explain why many saw the war as unavoidable. Historian Paul Johnson writes that most Americans in the 1840s were contemptuous of the way, quote, Mexico was governed or misgoverned, the endless coups, the intermediate and exceedingly cruel and often bloody civil conflicts, and the general insecurity of life and property. It's, it was the case that uh, the, the economic and political sense for the civilized United States was to wrest as much territory as possible from the hands of Mexico's greedy and irresponsible leaders. So that was the position of Johnson looking at it as something that had to be done and there were good reasons for the Americans to, to go to war given the how, the, the how things were in Mexico itself among the, the strife, the, the political strife and the unhappiness among, among others, um, among the, the many of the Mexican people themselves. Well, not since the Louisiana Purchase 40 years earlier had America gained such a large tract of land. During the 1840s, Americans acquired over 1 million square miles of new territory and even, there's, there was another additional land that came by the Gladstone Treaty, and that was five years after the war. So in 1853, the Americans concluded a treaty, the Gadsden Treaty, which gave the United States an area south of the Gila River at the cost of $10 million. And this was a significant chunk of what, what is today the state of Arizona. That Gadsden purchase uh, almost reaches up fairly close to, to the city of, of Phoenix. So that was additional land that the uh, Americans uh, got through this, through this treaty. So this purchase and the total of California, New Mexico, Texas, and the Oregon acquisitions increased America's territory by about one third. It was really quite, uh, quite significant. There were several key points about the Mexican American War, and I just want to note four of them. First, Demo the Democratic James Polk, President Polk, wanted to limit the cost of the war. He didn't want to have an expensive war. Senator Thomas Benton, also a Democrat, wrote that Polk wanted, quote, a small war just large enough to require a treaty of peace and not large enough to make military reputations dangerous for the presidency, end of quote. So the issue here is the concern that you would have generals who would end up being political opponents to the Democratic Party. 
Polk was successful in that the war resulted in uh, this huge acquisition of land for the United States. He was popular, but he honored his pledge to serve only one term as president. So he just, he just had that one term. Uh, second, the uh, American military leadership during the war was impressive. Both General Zachary Taylor and General Winfield Scott, for example, were com competent leaders backed by promising soldiers, including, and these names would, would uh, in the future be well known, and that is Captain Robert E. Lee. Captain George B. McClellan, Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant, and Colonel Jefferson Davis. Again, these men would play key roles in the Civil War years, years later. Point three, the conquest of California met little resistance. In June 1846, John Fremont raised the flag of a grizzly bear and star and proclaimed the Republic of California. The next month, Commodore John D. Sloat of the Pacific Fleet proclaimed California U.S. territory. Stephen Kearney, G General Kearney, proceeding westward from Santa Fe, lost the battle against the Mexicans, Mexicans, but eventually joined other Americans and they were able to defeat the, the, the Spanish there in Southern California. The acquisition of California, which had its first permanent Spanish settlement in 1769, was a bigger prize than Texas at the time. California had an excellent climate, fertile soil, and natural resources. The Great California Gold Rush of 1849 is a case in point. Four, fourth point, the total land acquisition increased America's territory by one third. Most Americans approved. However, expansion planted the seed for, for disunion. Serious sectional differences exacerbated by the debate over slavery lurked beneath the surface. Western expansion only made the situation worse because every new state carried the potential to destroy the precarious balance between free and slave states. Slavery, the issue which had always divided the nation, became a central part of just about every major development in the West. Should slaves work in the gold fields? Which lands will be free and which will be slave? Where should a transcontinental railroad be built? Through free or slave states? There were no clear answers to these questions. And this goes back to the reluctance back uh, earlier period before the Mexican-American War, the reluctance of Washington to bring Texas into the fold, to bring it part of the union. Again, just fearful of the, the issue of slavery. So this was something that was pressing and would not be resolved until years later. So we have a balance of, of good and bad as a result of expansionism and the Mexican-American War. Certainly for the economy, the acquisitions were crucial, were very important in that the various uh, trade networks, um, the natural resources that are, will be available, 
and the, the free land for pioneers, for people seeking liberty and, and, and a new way of life. There, there, there is, you know, a, a very long list of very positive things that came out of this expansionism. I didn't talk about it today, but in this lecture, but we also see on the, the negative side, not only the issue of slavery, but what was happening with the indigenous people, with the Indian people. And this uh, would actually become much more serious after the Civil War. After the Civil War, we have increasing conflict between the American army and native peoples uh, attempting to maintain their traditional way of life. Thank you.